think, let, let's just stay on this track for a second. So the, the BRIC nations, they're, you know, looking to implement a gold trading system, like you said, and they're looking at Colmex, they're looking at London, Swiss, and, you know, they're saying the paper markets are over. I mean, how is this going to affect the gold uh, pricing? I mean, they're going to rework the entire benchmark of gold? Well, they might just not use paper futures contracts they might I, I don't really know i mean i'm not part of the BRICS gold market based china and russia i'm not part of their decision making but if they want to break the comex i think the best way to do that is to ignore it not to integrate some like like shanghai did shanghai might have made a mistake we'll, we'll see they integrated their pricing system with london and and now all you do is you see this one two three four percent premium of the Shanghai gold price versus London, which is minuscule. Two three percent to me is absolutely nothing. If you're going to have a, a legitimate gold price, and you want to see a premium put in, and you want to see legitimacy, then I want to see a twenty to forty percent differential between Shanghai gold and London gold. So if if the if the BRICS nation led by Russia and China, you know, linking Beijing bank offices and trading platforms with the Moscow banking and trading platform, if they want to break COMEX, the best thing they could do is ignore it and come up with a different pricing system, not an integrated pricing system tied in with London and New York. You integrate with London and New York, and I think you become subject to them. And and that could be some of the problems that Shanghai is having right now. They cannot break free of the London structure. I think they need to just set up a, a brand new pricing system in Russia and China, boast that it's based on physical metal transactions and delivery and say we are not related in any way, shape, or form with the price discovery system that is corrupted beyond recognition and beyond repair in London and New York. That's what I would do. And notice that, that Russia has done some very important things. They set up a Sverbank office in Beijing and and China set up a Bank of China office in Moscow, uh, and they've got uh, uh, an inter, oh, I don't know what they call it. It's like a swift bank transaction system bilateral just between China and Russia. I can't remember the name, uh, just a, can't, a standard vanilla kind of name. Uh, and then China has done something much bigger, and that's set up the CIPS transaction system, which is a much more global competitor to SWIFT. It's the cro uh, cross, oh, I'm sorry, C-I-P-S, uh, cross-border, cross-border interbank payment system. Some people think it's a Chinese interbank. No, it's cross-border. They want it to be international and not just Chinese, but they're, they run it. <clears throat> so, the Chinese and Russians are doing a lot of good things. They're doing a lot of smart things. They're doing a lot of things that are rebellious toward the dollar. And I think they're all going to be proved quite effective. Uh, the bigger mystery is what's going on in, in Shanghai and the delays there. But let's just focus on the BRICS bank, uh, gold trading system platform. Um, I made comments and I have been making them, Dave, for at least three years, that I expect that the BRICS Development Bank would eventually branch off, in addition to managing projects, the BRICS Development Bank would eventually become an office for converting treasury bonds, euro bonds, UK gilts, and Japanese government bond, in other words, the four major sovereign bonds, converting them to gold bullion for the banks within the BRICS nation system. Now, we're not getting any indication of that yet, but what we are seeing is the BRICS are setting up a gold trading platform. <clears throat> what I'm looking for next is some mention that the BRICS Development Bank will facilitate in activity 
with the BRICS gold trading platform. I think it's natural. I think it's going to come. And, and one reason I said that regarding the BRICS Development Bank, it, it was simple logic. The Asian Investment in, uh, Asian in Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, was set up and started gathering in nations. And it looked like it was putting the BRICS Development Bank in the shadows, certainly in, in the rear guard. So if the AIIB was going to run and run hard <clears throat> with the Eastern nations, emerging market nations, etc., then it kind of leaves the BRICS Development Bank without a purpose. And that's when I started thinking, well, their purpose could be uh, facilitating conversion of major nation sovereign bonds into gold. And that's what I think is going to happen sooner or later. While this is happening here, they, the Chinese, the Russians, they've done a, a lot of other things. You mentioned the payment system, but the yuan has been included in the SDR basket. They're setting up this new gold trade system. They also created the petro yuan. Now, how does the petro yuan, is, is that a threat to the petro dollar? Only as much a threat as putting a shotgun in, in the mouth of a victim. So you're saying yes. <laughs> I'm saying capital Y, capital E, capital S, hell yes. Um, Petro Yuan linking, linking oil sales to the Chinese RMB. You know, just for those who aren't familiar, RMB is Renminbi. It's, it's kind of a second name for the Chinese Yuan. Um, <clears throat> linking that, linking Chinese oil sales followed by other like Asian oil sales, followed by other like emerging market oil sales, followed by other like BRICS oil sales. You see where I'm going here. China will be followed by Asia, emerging markets, and BRICS. If they start winning the right to buy oil and pay in RMB, and furthermore, to lock the contracts, like the forward contracts with the Shanghai uh, futures contract relating, say, oil to gold and oil to the RMB, in particular the oil and the RMB, then what you have is a mechanism for inducing, say, Gulf region Arab and Iranian dealers to sell their oil to Asia and the emerging market, and the BRICS nations, and accept RMB. And I am almost certain the U.S. government has told the Saudis, don't accept RMB unless you want big problems with us. And big problems translate into assassinations and terrorist events by their hidden tool called ISIS. So U.S. is specializing in terror during this war on terror, which is more aptly called a war of terror to defend the dollar. The Arabs are being told, don't accept RMB. But there's one nation that does, a monarchy called Qatar. Qatar is now accepting RMB in energy sales, oil and gas. And, and the irony is just astounding. The U.S. military has a big central command center, CENTCOM, in, oh, in Qatar. And the Emirate nation accept RMB for oil and gas payments from China. They've got a, a lot of trade with China. Qatar and China have trade dominated by oil, and a lot of the trade is being settled in RMB. So right under the U.S. nose, right under the U.S. military tent, there's Arab monarchy oil sales in RMB. So there is precedent, but the Saudis are special. The Saudis are like linked at the hip with the U.S. Treasury Department, and that linkage, I think, is in the form of the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Let me do some simple mat napkin math. Uh, the Saudis since 1970, we're talking about 45 years. I would say all but maybe two of those years, they were the leading oil producer in the world. 
in, in the, on, on planet Earth, the globe. As leading oil producer, they had tremendous surpluses in the early years. Their population was less. Their welfare payments to their people in Saudi Arabia was less. Their arms purchase were less. So they had huge surpluses. And yet, in the last couple of years, we have separated from the TIC report, uh, Treasury uh, Investment Capital Report, I think it stands for, the TIC report. It's Treasury bonds. Who, who owns them among foreign central banks? In the last two years, they separated Saudi Arabia from the OPEC oil producers. Um, I think what that meant was that the three trillion or five trillion dollars in oil surpluses that the Saudis had stored by agreement at the U.S. government Department of Treasury have been stolen, confiscated, maybe as part of the exchange stabilization fund creation. Maybe as part of the Saudi petrodollar, they they call it the the petro surplus agreement, uh, put all their surplus dollars, uh, surplus uh, payments in dollars. They receive them in dollars, keep them in dollars, store them in treasuries, and what better place to put them in than the Department of Treasury of the United States government? Okay, I don't believe for a minute that the Saudis are down to 150, 170 billion dollars in treasury bonds after 40 years of being the leading oil producer now it's more like about 5000 billion more like about 4000 billion so i think that maybe as part of the agreement with the petrodollar set up in 73 they agreed to store their treasuries at the us government and to forfeit them after say 35 or 40 years i don't know i'm not privy to such ridiculous, weird agreements. Uh, But something big is going on. It looks like in the last few years, the United States is throwing the Saudis under the bus. And I have very good indication uh, from The Voice and other contacts who have confirmed that the criminality, the, the criminal prosecutions for first UBS and then Credit Suisse by the U.S. government, which, by the way, has no jurisdiction in Swiss banks. The U.S. government was saying, well, since you've got dollar accounts uh, and you're doing tax dodging for American citizens, we have jurisdiction over our, our citizenry and we're going to prosecute UBS and we're going to take control of your bank. Well, there's a reason why they wanted to take control of the bank, and that was to steal the Arab gold in the, bu- in the bullion banks located in Switzerland. Then they came up with another farcical charge against Credit Suisse, and that was for violating Iran sanctions, which might be rather spurious and questionable in legality also. And that was, I believe, to finish off the Arab gold. And what I heard was, the Arabs, led by Saudi, because they were the biggest producers and therefore the biggest gold reserve owners, were in a panic two or three years ago to get their gold out of Switzerland, and they did so. Ironically, it's being stored in Germany at Deutsche Bank, which doesn't have any problems, does it? Oh, my gosh. What a mess. What a mess. I think we threw, the Americans threw the Saudis under the bus, Evidence coming from lots of different places. And I think uh, now we're starting to see the beginnings of uh, an internal turmoil in Saudi land. I've got disagreement with a couple members of my jackass colleagues. And I don't ever claim to say to them, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I got this all right. You got this all wrong. No, no, I have a lot more respect for them. That's why they... I help them to, through invitation, to be part of my jackass colleague crew. They're smart. And, and a couple of them are saying it looks like the Saudis with the arrests and the criminal prosecution, call it what you want, are going to be able to confiscate a lot of questionable royal money and questionable business accounts 
from non-royals and buy time. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, they might buy time, but I don't think they're going to be able to avoid some significant friction with the old King Fahd family, the old King Abdullah family, and the former Crown Prince Nayef family. And now they've arrested Prince Bandar, who's got a nickname of Bandar Bush. I think he's a narcotics dealer at a very high level. Uh, so now you've got the Bandar family also. That's four families who are in opposition with this Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Dave, I don't think that's a stable situation, even if they confiscate a hundred or two hundred billion dollars. No, I, I another don't. colleague made a different point. Last point, he okay. said, "Jim, do you realize that a lot of this Saudi royal money is not sitting in Saudi banks where they can just go grab it? It's in banks <coughs> all over the country. I mean, banks all over the region, and banks all over Europe, and banks even in Asia. And and there might be some blocks." put on by countries like China for having the royal funds in bank accounts returned. So this is getting very complicated. I think the Saudis are in a very difficult situation, and I don't think it's going to avoid uh, a conflict toward a palace coup. I don't want to call it a palace coup. Conflict toward a palace coup. Now, do you think this has to do with uh, Saudi Arabia making deals with Russia and this is the beginning stages of a pivot away from the U.S.? I sure do. Just look at some of the the deals. Uh, you know, not just oil. The deals. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a big oil producer. It's an important point. They're a sweet, crude producer which means kind of low viscosity low contaminants and just like ideal oil that's why they use the word sweet it's just sweet oil it doesn't need much processing so why did they why did they set up a deal with russia uh to buy oil to guarantee an oil shipment when russia is their biggest rival the answer, I think, is simple. The Saudis are desperate for cash flow. The Russians offered them a guarantee on cash flow because the Russians have a gigantic cash flow from their big Chinese client in energy, both oil and gas. Okay, what are the consequences of Saudi linking up with Russia like that? Well, I've been making this point for a while. I call it the consortium, the Russian consortium. Their oil consortium is run by Rosneft, and they've got they've gathered in Iran, another big producer. So why is Russia, um, why is Russia making a deal on on buying Iranian oil and joining a consortium, except to create a pool of non-dollar payments for oil? that will compete against the petrodollar. I think this Rosneft consortium, which includes Venezuela, by the way, they desperately need liquidity, cash liquidity. Russian Rosneft is setting up the oil pool. Saudi is dipping their foot in this non-dollar oil pool that I call the Russian consortium. And I think it's pissing off, angering tremendously the U.S., leadership, government, finance, military, all, all the above, pissing them off. Okay, in addition, the Saudis have agreed for military purchases from Russia, missiles. Uh, they might just want the best missiles around. So they're going to Russia to get the SU missiles because they're the best around. In the meantime, Saudis are also making deals with China. It's not just oil deals, not just the Ramco talks toward investment. They're making deals with China also in missiles to the point that about eight months ago, in a Riyadh parade, they were displaying Chinese missiles 
while they're still part of the U.S. petrodollar system. Okay, that's dangerous parade in my book. The Saudis also arranged with China a, a rather broad investment agreement, outside oil. I mean, China doesn't offer them, you know, great technology, but what they offer them is, is investment capital toward expanding uh, their technological reach, and that's where I think Germany might come in. Germany or Britain and the United States, but I really think in the future, the U.S. and Britain are going to have a smaller, uh, what's the word, footprint, uh, impact in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The big issue right now is something that China has been pushing for for months. They want to buy Saudi oil and pay in RMB. Americans are telling the Saudis, don't do that. If you do, you're going to have some big problems with us. So they're not doing that yet. And now <clears throat> I think the Chinese are realizing that they've got this Aramco investment concept, this opportunity, which could be used as leverage. Let's just say the Saudis buy 10% and lay down $200 billion uh, for the Saudi Aramco. And it's going to be really important to, to look at the dollar amount, $200 billion, and then look to see what they claim is the percentage of Aramco ownership. Now, on, under current Saudi valuation, that would be 10%. But I think it's going to be closer to 50%. If they lay down $100 billion, that would be 5%. But since they're overpricing it by a factor of five, they're lying about the value of Aramco. I think what we've got is a situation where China is going to lay down, say, $100 billion as a starter. And the public is going to infer that it's 5% when it's really going to be 25%. Because the Saudis will admit to the Chinese that it's not worth $2 trillion. It's more like worth about $400 or 500 billion and that's what the western energy analysts have concluded worth about 400 to 500 billion but the point i'm making is that the chinese are going to use the aramco investment to get leverage to win the right to buy oil from saudis in rmb that's what the Chinese want. They've been bickering about this. They've been harping about this. They've been complaining and nagging. They're really angry that they're buying oil from a third party and using U.S. currency. They don't think the U.S. is involved in the Saudi purchase. Therefore, the U.S. currency should not be used in the Saudi purchase. And they make a good point. But what they're driving a nail into is the heart of the petrodollar. And they're just going to keep whacking away with this hammer and finding new places to put the nail and continue to whack other nails until they win the right to buy Saudi oil in RMB. And then you're going to get other nations looking to do the same. Then you're going to get other Arab monarchies looking to do the same because they don't want to lose their Chinese clients. There's competition going on now among the Arab oil monarchies. I think the big winner in all this is going to be Iran. Iran yeah. has just got both feet now in the Eurasian trade zone. They're, they're signing up with you know very solid uh, Chinese deals, Russian deals. Now there's a big Russian port uh, deal uh, that, that's going to line up pipelines. And uh, they, they call it the, the, the Russian pivot. Um, they got a name for it. I can't think of the name for it, but I, I included it in the November Hattrick letter reports. Uh, when the U.S. yet again broke another treaty, I mean, golly, how many nations, important nations, they call it the, the, the U.N. plus, plus one. Or, you know, it was the U.N. security nations plus Germany to make sure that all the signatory nations for the Iran nuclear deal would be of, of not just high repute, but significance in global politics. And my gosh, 
Trump just waited four or five months and then he abrogated the deal that Obama struck. And, and there are lots of rumors that Obama had some secret provisions in the Iran nuclear deal, and I don't know what they were. I, just being the typical jackass, I was throwing in that maybe there's some narcotics clauses in there. Uh, <clears throat> don't know. I mean, if Iran wants to play ball with us, they got to play ball with narcotics movement and money laundering. Uh, Turkey is, is no longer in that game. But uh, I think the winner is going to be Iran. And uh, with all the strife, and I, I'm really watching this Ramco deal. Notice that Trump, President Trump, it's pretty hard to say President Trump without a little giggle inside, but President Trump. Uh, is mentioning now the desire to have Aramco listed in in New York if, among the stock market uh, listings. And uh, gosh, I, I wonder if he remembers that the Congress, with his full support, uh, wrote up the Saudi 9-11 uh, lawsuit confiscation bill. It's got a name, but I don't care what they call it. It's about confiscating Saudi assets. Well, the upshot consequence of that congressional bill, Dave, is that Saudi assets are frozen in U.S. banks, putting more stress on the Saudis. They don't have access to their money, which is a very painful process. And that's why they're trying to do the Aramco deal. That's why they're trying to do uh, bond issuance deals to cover their deficits, cover their war costs. Um, I don't think the Saudis want a New York listing. They might say, well, you want us to have a New York listing, you need to drop your lawsuit bill and drop all your uh, – stop freezing our bank accounts. Start becoming a friend instead of a uh, predator. The U.S. is a really big, big predator. You know, Jim, you mentioned something very interesting and, I mean – many different interesting things. But one thing just stood out in my mind when you said that Saudi Arabia made a deal with Russia to purchase their missiles. Uh, so did Iraq. So did Egypt. So did, uh, I mean, Syria has the SU uh, missile system in their country now. Uh, so did Iran. And it all seems to be on a common ground where they're buying Russia technology to protect against the U.S.? I mean, if you really look at it this way, if everything is pivoting over to Russia and China, you wouldn't want to buy U.S. missile systems or U.S. equipment. You would want to buy it from the country that you're pivoting it over to to protect yourself from an invading force. And it seems like that's what they're doing right now. Well, I, I agree. There's another angle to that. You, you don't just want to have missiles placed in those countries that are built and, and made and delivered from, let's just call it en the enemy camp to the U.S., you want something else. You want the best missiles. That is true. And the United States doesn't make the best missiles. Donald Trump is, was boasting recently about the Patriot missile. Well, that's 20 to 25 years old in its technology, and I think he's lying on some of its performance characteristics. Uh, if they do a side-by-side -side comparison with the Russian SU, I think you'll find that there is rather notable superiority from the other camp. And the same goes true with the cruise missile versus the Russian Sunburn and Onyx. Uh, I, could, I could cite you details, but if, if you want confirmation on that, just, just, just call up the Pentagon because they're, they're, they're very well aware. We're getting into messy situations here, Dave. Uh, the, the Saudis uh, are going to be under pressure to stop the Yemen war. Uh, the Chinese are pressuring the Saudis to make peace with Iran. The U.S. is pressuring the Saudis to make war with Iran. The Chinese want peace with Iran, which will come at a price. It will come at a price of stopping the Yemen war. And I don't know that Saudis are prepared to do that because Prince MB, MBS, Prince Salman, is a very aggressive uh, 
sort. And you know, I don't want to start calling him names like lunatic, but he seems to be just off the chart aggressive. And and let me just throw out there, I've said this before, uh, the China, uh, the Saudis, I think, have at least sixty to seventy percent lower oil reserves than they state. They're always stating pretty much the same figure of 260 billion barrels of oil, and that hasn't changed in 30 or 40 years, but their production schedules continue on their merry way, and apparently there's no depletion. I, I just call it Mickey Mouse mathematics. They claim that they have new discoveries. Well, they do, but they're small. So I think they've got 60 to 70 percent less in their reserves, and therefore they want to steal Yemen's untapped reserves. So if they don't get at Yemen's reserves, uh, they're going to be in trouble. But the war is not going well for Saudi, and one of the examples of blowback is that the the Houthi rebels, uh, I just call them, I just call Yemen, the Yemen army, the Yemen factions, they're now doing attacks on the oil fields in western Saudi Arabia near the Yemen border. So Saudi's oil fields out there on the frontier are not safe. The Saudis are going to try to steal Yemen's oil fields, and they might lose some of their own. So the Saudi situation is becoming dire, in addition to all the different royal conflicts, because Prince Salman wrestled the crown prince post from a different royal named Nayef. N-A-Y-E-F. And there's resentment in the Nayef family, and I think it carries over into the Abdullah and Fahd families, which have significant power because they were former kings. Fahd was a king for a long time. Abdullah was a king for something like seven or eight years. Now Salman is king, and he's not that strong. He's suffering from dementia. He's got a lot of weaknesses, but I... The Voice pointed something out to me recently, uh, just, just telling, filling in some background. He said, you may not know it, but Prince Salman, King now, now King Salman, when he was a prince, was a governor of Jeddah and was known as a rather hardline guy who was a firm prosecutor against corruption, and he did corruption uh, – Activity. He, no, I'm sorry. How do you say it? Prosecution. He conducted uh, attacks, prosecution attacks on princes, on royals. So when he was younger, he was a tough guy. And now he's weakened and older. And I really question whether he went to the Kremlin to sign deals. I think his double did. Uh, it's not that hard to produce a double. Uh, the Americans do it all the time. The doubles for Hillary. I think the last CNN hosted uh, debate between Trump and Hillary had a second double stand in for Hillary. Very interesting. Suddenly she looked 40 years younger or 30 years younger. She looked like she was a woman in her late 40s or early 50s. Doubles are not hard to do. Obama is reported to have doubles who who, you know, function very capably in, in various dignitary, dignitary, uh, roles and, and maybe fundraising roles while Obama, the real Obama is busy playing golf, uh, was busy playing golf. Uh, he's still doing fundraising now, but, uh, he might use doubles to, uh, remove some of his risk in public appearances. They don't like public appearances. They're, they're exposed. I mean, Ask John Kennedy, how, how, how'd that work out for you? Um, oh, my goodness. The, the, the Saudi situation, I think, is just absolutely critical for the defense of the petrodollar, and it cannot be defended. And if it can't be defended, I don't think the Saudi kingdom can be defended. And I think the Prince Salman is, has got some very big problems that have been aggravated doubly by the arrests. 
and and we're told now through various channels that when certain royals and leading businessmen were arrested, they were told, hand over 60% of your money to the Saudi kingdom treasury or you stay in prison. Now, I don't care the form of the prison. It was, a you know, the Ritz-Carlton and Riyadh and, you know, it's, it's swank, but they're still sleeping on the floor with mattresses and they're still humiliated. They don't like this. So many of them have signed, and I'm, I'm told that it, it's something like a hundred billion that have been uh, gathered so far. You, know, you you can gather the funds, Prince Salman, but you're going to win resentment, and and this culture loves revenge. I mean, they 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 make kind of a ritual out of it. So I don't think the Saudi Kingdom is going to remain. And I, I don't have a timetable, but I think this year coming, 2018, is going to be rather tumultuous for the Saudis. I, I don't know how Prince Salman's going to hang on. And there was recently a helicopter shot down. And uh, a prince named Mukreen, M-U-Q-R-I-N, Mukreen, he was killed. Well, if Prince Salman had not grabbed the crown prince role, post, Mukreen might have had a claim to the throne in addition to the former crown prince, Nayef. So Mukreen and Nayef might have ha had a battle, and, and now Mukreen's dead. Um, I don't want to get into Prince Al-Walid. He was another one of the rest. There are rumors now that he's dead. He's the uh, Citigroup investor, Prince Al-Walid. Um, he's, he's a friend of the family for Wall Street. Uh, I think that means he's in our, in, involved in narcotics. I think he and Bandar Bush have been the main point men for the Saudi narcotics system, subsidiary of Langley. It's hard to get confirmation. You can't exactly call up or check a website for things like that because it's all very dark channels, dark money and, and criminal activity, Glo global criminality under the sovereign protection. Uh, very nasty stuff. I'm watching Saudi, Dave. I'm watching it from five different angles, and I'm really anxious to see when they announce – that they will accept RMB from China in oil sales. Really anxious. I think it's inevitable. I think the U.S. government real, realizes it's inevitable, and I think it's going to open up a next chapter that I call the dual universe, where the Chinese RMB system of commerce, trade, business, projects, banking, the RMB sphere, the RMB universe rises up, we're not, we don't know at what rate it will grow. I think it'll grow more than what we expect. And the other one is the U.S. dollar sphere. And we know what that is. It's, it's all the commerce, trading, financial markets, everything, banking reserves, you name it. I, I think it's going to give way to the Chinese and the U.S. is going to say, go, go ahead, have your way. You're not going to get very far and they're going to be wrong because China is going to start linking gold in with trade and banking and eventually finally currencies. So I'm looking forward to the dual universe being admitted where the U.S. basically says we're not going to go to war with nations that want to trade outside the dollar. But they would be two-faced unless they drop the sanctions against Iran. They can maintain all they want that Iran's a nuclear threat, which is a bunch of nonsense, when the real issue is Iran is selling oil and gas outside the dollar, just like Saddam Hussein did. We called them a nuclear threat when they were not a nuclear threat. <clears throat> we claimed that Saddam was a chemical weapons threat, and he was, but he bought it all from the United States. So the U.S. has got messy, messy fingerprints everywhere, I'm watching Saudi, and I'm watching the dual universe being approved, Dave. When this dual universe happens, I mean, are, 
Are we going to see anything here in the United States? Because as more and more countries use the petro yuan, like Venezuela, probably Syria, Iran, Saudi Arabia, what then happens here? I mean, do we see a slow change here in the in the U.S.? I think we're going to start seeing building pressure within the financial arena that the global currency reserve status for the dollar is given limited time, pardon me, given limited time, it's going to be a warning. The dollar as global reserve has limited time. I mean, you, you could you could just put a number on it and say, well, just plan on it, United States. In two years, you're not going to have it anymore. You're not going to have the global currency reserve status anymore. And that will mean that lots and lots of importers <laughs> – to the U.S. economy are going to be put on notice that they need to come up with a different system of paying for the shipments that come into the U.S. ports. They're going to be given notice that the dollar is just not going to be as valid, as accepted anymore. <clears throat> and that is precisely the pressure that I've been referring, referring to that will work toward the launch of the new Scheiss dollar, the domestic dollar. The dollar that is used for the United States, like, you know, the Argentine peso is used for Argentina. There's no global commerce in the Argentine peso. There's no Argentine debt securities used in banking systems as assets in other countries. So the domestic only dollar will be for the United States economy, commerce, cross-border trade, etc., and will have to float on its own justificated, justified value uh, with reference to its fundamentals, which are third world. Now, the big notice will be that the U.S. dollar will have to make preparations, the uh, custodians of the dollar will have to make preparations for the dollar no longer serving as global reserve currency. That's a very big step because in all past instances for the last 300 years, the result has been world war. So the U.S. is going to be given a challenge. Make your transition to a domestic dollar because you're going to lose your dollar global reserve status. Make preparations in order to avoid a world war. And the United States is saying, but we want a world war. Okay, That's the danger of having neocons, neoconservative fascists, dominating what I believe to be 70 to 80 percent of the Congress. That's why I don't look at political party, Democrat, Republican. It's silly. The link between the Bush and the Clinton administration was very clear. It was globalist and it was narcotics. The link for Obama, another cross-party uh, transition with the baby Bush administration, again, was narcotics and again was the globalist installation theme. So these neocons want the globalist uh, agenda to be abided by, but they also really like war because their friends in the weapons firms, the military industrial complex, make a lot of money, have huge flush budgets. Notice that Trump just followed the same old path. He increased the Pentagon budget. He claimed that we've got, uh, you know, shortages and uh, we've got depletions in the military. Well, yeah, if you end the wars, you stop that. But we love war, so we're in war everywhere we can. I'm surprised we don't declare war on Venezuela. Do a beachhead there. Why not? Why not invade Cuba? Castro's gone. Don't we need to prevent the Chinese and Russians from building military bases there, which they are doing? Why don't we invade Nicaragua? They're building Chinese military bases there. Oh my gosh. I got, I got more stories on Nicaragua that are really quite, quite interesting 
they got about $3 billion worth of hardwood that is being cleared for this supposed canal that will never happen in Nicaragua. But the two military bases on each coast for Chinese usage, they're full steam ahead. Okay, why doesn't the U.S. invade that country? Well, John, we love war. I mean, isn't more locations for war a better thing? No, we want war with the King Prize. We want war with Russia. We don't dare do war with China because they hold our debt. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, Dave, <clears throat> we're going to come to a point in the United States where the planning and the Wall Street analysis has to be geared around an end to the global reserve currency. And, and for those listeners who aren't really familiar with what that means, when the U.S. dollar possesses the global currency reserve status, it means two very important things. It means commerce trade payments led by oil, but not just oil. Commercial trade payments are done in the dollar. That includes consulting. It also means that the banking systems use U.S. Treasury bonds for their asset reserves. And what's coming with the, 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 the sunset of the global currency reserve for the USD, what's coming is that nations are going to dispose of their treasury bonds in their banking system and replace them with gold or Chinese government debt? I, I don't know. I think it's going to be a little bit of both, Chinese government bonds and gold bullion. And when they do so, the U.S. government and the Fed are going to be left with the unpleasant duty of processing dump treasuries. They're going to have to come up with more fabricated demand within the interest rate swap derivatives, and I think it's going to break soon. I've been saying this for a year. I think the cracks are already known in the interest rate swap derivative uh, market, and you're starting to see evidence now in inverted and flattening yield curves. They don't want flat yield curves. The 210 is flat. Two-year two versus 10-year, that's flat, which means that the, the two yields are almost equal. They don't want that. They don't want that. That's not good. It, it tells, it gives a big warning signal to all the foreign countries who have treasuries sitting in their banking reserves. It, it gives them a red warning, like, get ready for a crisis, like 2008. I'm calling it the systemic Lehman crisis, and I think it's already begun. It's a slow process. It's begun in Italy. The Italian banking system is collapsing. Oh, this U.S. dollar global currency reserve privilege has been abused, and the Eastern powers are taking it away. They're giving notice. Can't have it much longer. But a real blow to the heart of it would be the Chinese winning the right to buy Saudi oil and pay in RMB terms. Because Saudi is the embodiment of a nation that supports as a foundation, as a foundation, the petrodollar. If they start splitting, if they accept both dollar and RMB, it's just going to start some fractures and and you're going to see momentum growing in the fractures you're going to see other countries say well you know we see what's going on and we're going to start dumping our treasury bonds not so much because they'll be buying oil and rmb but because these other smaller intermediate sized nations are going to say we read the writing on the wall treasury bonds are not a good source a, a good asset to serve as banking reserve. Very exciting, very exciting time, and absolutely no shortage of material for the hat trick letter. None at all. Jim, I wanted to ask you, when this happens, this dual universe, and I'm just going to go back to that for a sec, 
when this starts to happen, um, are, are there going to be shortages here? Because when countries say, okay, listen, I can have the petro you want. I'm going to reduce my reliance on the petrodollar. I'm going to start dumping my treasuries. Are we going to have problems here in the U.S.? Well, it, it really speaks directly to the threat, the dynamics that will force the United States to come up with a domestic-only dollar. Rather than talking about the domestic-only dollar, let's talk about these forces and threats. Foreign suppliers will start telling the United States, we don't want treasury bills anymore. We're trying to reduce our U.S. treasury holdings. We don't want to accept for a container vessel U.S. treasury bills. We want something else. What else do you have? And the U.S. will say, well, we got U.S. Treasury bills or we got U.S. Treasury bills. Which one do you want? And they're going to say, well, we don't want either. Uh, they're going to start to say soon, we want a different unit of payment. And something like the gold trade note would be very satisfactory. And that's starting to come into view and I think will be built atop the Chinese gold oil contract and the RMB oil contract. The gold trade note might have more of an RMB imprint on it initially. If the U.S. vendors like, you know, Walmart, Office Depot, Target, Staples, uh, Home Depot, if the big chains balk and tell the foreign suppliers, we can only offer you treasury bills, sorry, that's just the world we live in. Those suppliers are going to say, well, then we're going to look to send that shipment to Brazil or Indonesia. And that'll mean less in the way of deliveries at U.S. ports. So you asked about shortages. I'm telling you how those shortages will come about. I think there's going to be balking. I think the U.S. vendors are going to be given pressure by the U.S. government. Don't offer a foreign vehicle, a foreign instrument. It's got to be U.S. type of payment for a a shipment to a U.S. port, we're the United States, where's your loyalty? And the U.S. companies are going to say, okay, well, we run the risk of having a shipment denied. And the U.S. government will say, so be it. Since when does the U.S. government mind screwing up the economy? Just take a look at Obamacare. You want to see an example of screwing up the economy. You want another example? How about the highest corporate tax rates in the world and among all nations? Okay, so the pressure is going to be acute for the U.S. vendors to continue to, to offer treasuries, treasury bills uh, as payment. Uh, it, it's, it's the most liquid vehicle in U.S. dollar terms. But, you know, India, China... Other countries, they're going to start saying, we, we don't want any more. We're dumping ours. Why would we want to accept exactly what we're selling to readjust and make stronger our banking system foundation with reserve assets? We're trying to reduce our U.S. treasuries by 10%. That's our goal this year. We don't want your treasury bills as payment. What's the impact going to be? Well, you got the shortages. Fine, but there's something else. There's going to be pressure to launch this new dollar. You cannot lose your treasure. I'm sorry. You cannot use your global currency reserve status without having a different currency. And, and it brings up huge questions. What's going to happen to all the dollars? In, in foreign accounts that are not in the United States. And right now they're, they're living under the shadow of the FATCA rules. 
I think what it means is when the U.S. loses dollar, dollar loses its global currency reserve status, the FATCA rule will end, and there'll be a, a, a gigantic celebration among hundreds of nations because they regard it as onerous, costly, and a real impediment to doing business in their countries. But there's something else that it brings up. When the U.S. dollar loses its reserve status, there have to be a different organized body for regulatory duties on managing the dollars that are out there in various concentrated areas. I, I like pointing to Panama dollar accounts, Singapore dollar accounts, Swiss dollar accounts, Hong Kong dollar accounts. Who's going to be the regulatory body to manage all that? And I think it's going to be the IMF run by China. I think China's going to take that duty, take that mantle, and run with it. They're going to say, we want control of that because we can do it fairly and countries trust us. Countries don't trust Washington. There's just too much duplicity, sanctions, thefts, bank account thefts, frozen accounts, murders to capture gold. Foreign countries don't trust the United States. This is not the United States that our fathers grew up in. I keep telling my dad that he hates to hear me say it. My dad's going to turn 98 soon. He still hates some of my messages regarding the hat trick letter. He said, well, Jim, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I want you to know that I was wearing my U.S. military cap uh, to a barbecue last week. And I said, well, that's great, Dad. You're, you're still living in the 1940s. I said, I hope you don't get questions about war crimes in Syria and Ukraine. And he said, oh, Lord, no. Going back to this dual universe, will a lot of these dollars flow back to the U.S. and devalue the dollar here at the same exact time this is all happening? The dual universe, yes. Uh, there is a big movement right now. It's called repatriated dollars. The, the first thing is, what is a repatriated dollar, a dollar that could be repatriated? It's a dollar sitting in a foreign account uh, owned by an American citizen or an American company like a subsidiary, like, say, in Brazil. Okay. Next question, how much, how much volume does it have? And I'm hearing that it could be around 20 to 22 trillion. Okay, that's what I heard from a fellow who had connections with uh, U.S. government security agencies. It was Cato. He said that there is a movement in progress, on the books, with existing offers that are legal and and you know, as part of policy, to offer either a 20% or a 20%, I'm sorry, 10% or a 20% tax on the repatriated funds. And that's a big discount, a big reduction on what the past was. I think the past was... I'm not exactly sure. I think it was 30 to 35 percent. So to qualify for 10 percent, there had to be some kind of a statement, a plan, a prospectus, or an application, something formalized. For instance, let me just make something up. That they, uh, you know, Joe Blow with his uh, Panama account with three billion dollars wanted to come back and open up. Uh, a lot of, of businesses in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida that would have to do with uh, import-export and some refineries uh, and some office buildings. And he wanted to join the, the 
Rebuild America movement. Okay, hey, you qualify. You're a good, good citizen. You get that 10%. But well, let's suppose, let's suppose there was another guy who said, uh, I have uh, one billion in a Hong Kong account. I want to open up a trading outfit in California and Seattle, and I want to do trade with the Eurasian Trade Zone, and I want to uh, work toward the One Belt One Road, all their cornucopia projects, and I want to put to work my one billion in Hong Kong. And they say, well, you know, that sounds good, but uh, it could be better. Uh, you get 20%. Okay, so if you're favorable to waving the flag and U.S. objectives, you get the, the rosy 10% tax of your repatriated funds. And if you have some other plan uh, that's not quite so favorable to U.S. progress, U.S. interests, I love that word, interests, that means consistent with the fascist plan, then you don't get the, the rosy 10, you get a 20%. And if you come up with a plan that's even more onerous, like, oh, I want to open up some uh, Idaho, uh, some Des Moines and St. Louis offices to do gold acquisition for domestic investors in the United States, they might say, well, uh, you're stuck with the existing 35%. Screw you. That's that's how I think it's going to work. So we know what a repatriated dollar is. We know what the volume is. We know what the tax incentives are. The only thing left is how much is coming home. And the answer is not too much. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. It's just my opinion. I think two big reasons. Uh one is they might think that the dollars they bring home would be trapped and partially confiscated with bail-ins. Second, they might think it would get trapped and forced into the new shice dollar and have forced devaluation. So not much is coming in because the United States government is not making it clear what their bail-in plans are, and they're not making it clear what the characteristics of the inevitable new dollar will be. I call it the scheiss dollar because it's German for shit. I just had a, a, a follower send me an email saying, Jim, look at these following seven German words. Scheiss means shit, but when you say there's rubbish, uh, there's flotsam, jetsam, there's uh, you know, refuse, that's not scheiss. That's schwarzen. Oh, okay, fine. So I'm just going to run with it. Scheiss means shit. Great. I'm, I'm happy to know that. The United States government is not making clear its future plan. They're not making the business community and the trading, import and export industries confident about what's coming. I think they're going to launch a big surprise and conduct a trillion dollar theft. And if you don't think there's precedent, <laughs> take a look at the TARP funds, 2008. So Jim, what do you think the timeline is for all this? I mean, we, we're we seeing things accelerate where China, you know, is included in the SDR basket. They're trying, they're bringing on a gold trade system. They've created the Petro Yuan. Uh, when do you think this will all start to happen? Well, I think it's started to happen already. Uh, you have the, the Shanghai Gold Exchange. That's been in, in operation now for well over a year. That's a very big step toward wrestling the, the gold market control. Um, you just had, in August, the Shanghai Gold for Oil futures contract and the launch for the Shanghai oil RMB contract is imminent, tie them all together and the Russians can sell China oil and convert the RMB to gold, bang, bang, just like that. So you have the Asian infrastructure invest, I'm sorry, Asia infrastructure investment bank. That's well along. Uh, even the British signed up for that really angering the Obama administration. 
That just shows you that when it comes to the dollar losing its reserve status, even the British will work on the other side. Uh, they're the financial fashion. They'll, they'll just find whatever partners they can to keep the London Financial Center going, Brexit or no Brexit. You have the One Belt, One Road set of projects. That's already in progress. They got multi-billions and numerous projects that are, I think some of them have broken ground and begun. Um, but I think the real question you're, answer, you're asking is, do I have a timeline for the end of the dollar, the, the, the release of the gold price, uh, the dual universe being a, a adopted without the war theme? Oh, boy, very difficult question, and, and it's a common question asked. The voice told me when I asked him, what do you make, this was a conversation back in, in August and September, what do you make of the Chinese uh, oil for gold futures contract? How could it be tied in with a gold trade note for trade purposes, trade payment purposes? He said, Jim, know this clearly. The Chinese gold oil contract is the first of several non-dollar platforms to be rolled out. The first of several. <clears throat> and then I asked, because this, this was a, a bit of a conversation rather than just an answer, and, and, and that's the end of it. You know, it, it just spawns a lot of curiosity and questions. And a couple of my other colleagues joined in in, in the process. What he said was, Look, for every two to four months, the next vehicle platform to roll out and know very clearly that each platform or vehicle to be rolled out has been stress tested. In other words, these are not new items that are going to be rolled out and we'll see how this works out. No, they've already done stress testing and I guarantee you the stress test is a, is 10 times more effective and with more pressure and scrutiny than the dumbass bank stress tests that the U.S. and EU do. Okay, well, if August, the eighth month, was the first rollout, and we're going to get another one every two to four months, well, four more months is December, and we're in December. So I think December or January, we might get a surprise next rollout. And he said to me in follow-up, when you get a few of these non-dollar platform vehicles rolled out, you're going to see incredible pressure on the dollar, on the gold market, and I said, even pressure for the launch of a Scheiss dollar? And he said, well, yeah, because it will mean that the, the dollar as global reserve currency is losing its status in front of your face. Okay, there's another one, the CIPS. I, I mentioned it before. It's the competitor to SWIFT. Okay, now you've got the BRICS gold platform. Russia and China will form the HIP, uh, the axis for that. So with a new gold platform and a new... SWIFT payment system, by the way, the CIPS is uh, much cheaper. I'm hearing it's like 80% cheaper for transactions than SWIFT. So if Iran wants to do payments with China, they don't need, they don't, have, they don't care about the SWIFT sanctions and the block. They'll use CIPS. And if the Russians and Chinese want to do something and, and they don't want to, you know, deal with the ferryman. I call it the ferryman, the, the dollar toll taker for Swift. They don't want to deal with the Swift ferryman and pay a dollar fee. They'll just use the CIPS. It's starting to be called CHIPS. Uh, and CHIPS leads people to think it's, it stands for Chinese interbank payment. It's not. It's cross border, but it's the Chinese adopted, uh, CHIPS system. 
all this points to more and more pressure building, Dave. I don't know how to answer your question on timeline, except to say, look at the event schedule. I mean, I'm taking right out of General Schwarzkopf, uh, Desert Storm playbook. Look at the event schedule. When the next rollout comes, I'm thinking it's going to be a little bit more geared toward trade payments with a gold backing. That's what I think it's going to be. I mean, anything else would be preliminary to precisely that, the gold trade note. So what are they waiting for? Let's, let's do the gold trade note. Maybe they need something else before the gold trade note. I don't know the inner workings. And the voice uh, doesn't share much more than that. Um, so with all these different non-dollar platforms, some of which are getting populated, some of which are getting used, some of which are getting active projects, some of which are getting, you know, significant funding, some of which are getting lined up the engineers and construction firms, I think the pressure is just enormous for the dollar to lose its global currency reserve status. And you know, what I think is probably going to happen is it's going to lose its status without the U.S. admitting so. The U.S. is going to say, well, we're still the global currency reserve uh, for the majority of nations. <clears throat> okay, so an asterisk next to global currency reserve. <clears throat> That's where I think we're heading. And uh, as for timeline, let me try to get a little bit more specific. Uh, I remember back in interviews in early 2017 saying that by the end of 2017, we're going to have some systems break. And I'm not sure we really did. I think we're having a lot of very loud signals that systems are ready to break. So instead of seeing broken systems, we're seeing loud signals for the same. I think 2018 is the year we start seeing some broken, broken elements. Like Italy just breaks down. Their banking system breaks down. Like Saudi accepts RMB for oil. Um, there could be many more. Uh, there, there could be something like uh, Iran and the Saudis uh, declare detente. Uh, don't, don't know. Uh, it's, it's possible. It could be an agreement is worked out in Ukraine and the U.S. has put on notice, we don't want any more of your stinking wars. It could be uh, the EU and an announcement that there are no more enforced Russian san sanctions. That would be big, and I, I think it's it's very likely because if they don't do that, then the uh, the sanctions are going to be ignored and the EU is going to be embarrassed. So they better admit that they're not enforced so they don't get embarrassed. Uh, there there could be there, there could be numerous other. I think the the Gazprom pipeline uh, through through Turkey. I think that's going to make significant progress. I think they're going to – something's going to break with Syria, and I don't know what it's going to be. I think peace might break out, and the Israelis and Langley will be told you can't continue to fund with Saudi's assistance the ISIS guerrillas anymore. I'm being nice with the term guerrilla because that sounds better than terrorist. I don't like the use of the word terrorist. Uh, if you use Bitcoin, you're a terrorist. If you sell oil outside the dollar, you're a terrorist. Uh, if you talk to Russia and the State Department, you're a terrorist. I don't like all this. What it was turned out to be is anyone who is against, working against the fascist globalist agenda by the United States is declared a terrorist and it's nonsense. So <clears throat> look for those breaking points of Italy, Saudi, Iran, Ukraine, Russia with respect to EU, Gazprom with respect to to Turkey, uh, 
look for those areas as being hot spots for for evidence of both the dual universe and the fractured dollar reserve status. We're not going to see early in this sequence an announcement of the new Scheiss dollar. That's just not going to happen that way. Instead, we're going to see pressures building toward that. That will be the last defense, because once the new Scheiss dollar is launched, you're just going to see incredible problems. Um, the problems will will have to do with uh, shortages of supply, price inflation, and the resulting social disorder. They're, they're unavoidable. They all lead to each other. The new Scheiss dollar will involve all three. They're all unavoidable. That's the last line of defense. Um, I, I wish I knew better the event timeline, but we just don't know if the U.S. is going to launch a new war and buy more time. We just don't know if the Saudis will be able to gather in four or five hundred billion dollars and execute a hundred royals. We just don't know if that's going to happen. There are so many unknowns that the important part is to observe the, the major signals and the major pressure points and the events that I've listed, among others. There are more. I don't have a complete list of the events. <clears throat> We're winding down 2017, and we did not see the breakdowns that I expected. And I'll go so far as to say we're not seeing as many breakdowns as the voice expected either. And therefore, he's saying that 2018 is going to be a tumultuous year with some breakdown, breakdowns that are unavoidable. Because we didn't see them in 17. But the pressures rose in 17 in many different areas. So the pressure will be too much. And it will be realized in 2018. It's going to be a messy year, Dave. Very messy yeah. year.